Hello, can everybody hear me? Hello? Four score and seven years ago, our father. <laughs> Is that helping? Testing, one, two, three, check, check, check. Testing, one, two, three, check, check, check. I'm eating the mic, man. I don't get much louder. Okay, I can sit here and do this all day. I do tricks, I sing and dance. Well, you don't want me to sing. Can you guys survive this? Is the audio okay? What do you need, louder or less hum? the mic make more noise okay so you either get loud with a hum or not loud enough with no hum which do you prefer no hum all right I will try to yell so can we yeah is there a way to is it, should I just go ahead all right, so are you are we good to go? <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for coming down again. Uh, this next talk is going to be interesting. It's uh, fuck these guys, practical counter surveillance measures. Uh, uh, Lisa Lorenzen is going to present, and I hope you enjoy. Hello. Okay, our talk today is going to be on fuck these guys, practical counter surveillance. Lisa Lorenz is going to present. Hope everybody enjoys. Thank you. So I need to start off with two disclaimers. First of all, I am not an expert at this, and you will find that out further into the talk. I am just an amateur enthusiast who thinks this shit's important. Second of all, I am not speaking for my employer, my standards groups, any other professional affiliation, or anyone but myself. That's why I can do this. Oh, and there will be F-bombs, but you probably figured that already. So, as a user of the internet, you know, five years ago, if you had asked me who was the biggest threat to my privacy on the internet, I would have told you it was Google. Cookies, cookies everywhere. So, you know, they were the enemy. And All right, is it better over here? We good? It wasn't you. All right, so you know, you look at Google, they know a lot about what we do day to day. You've got access to the email that we send. And then I found out that Google was just the tip of the iceberg. So as everybody learned a few years ago with the Snowden revelations, it's not just Google who's using those cookies. It's not just the companies gathering all of this data on us. The government is intercepting our traffic, collecting our content, our metadata under a number of programs that we're not even allowed to know about in many cases. So when the initial revelations came out, NSA was trying to snoop on the intra data center links within Google. One of the Google engineers got a little bit annoyed about it. And I share his opinion. This is our government. We live in a nominally free country. This shit is not okay. All right, if this dies, I'm really hosed. So, not only are they intercepting these cookies, they're actually using them to reach out and attack people based on the traffic that they're sending and the associations that they have online. In effect, they're watching everything that we do. I was not exactly thrilled about this. <laughs> but
what the problem is, what are you going to do? You can't win. I can't make them stop tracking me. I can't break even. I can't even control what they get about me. I could quit the game, but seriously, is anybody going to stop using the internet today? Raise your hand. <laughs> You're a stronger soul than I am, frankly. So mostly I just sat around and whined about it to my friends, to be honest, for a few months. And then in March of 2014, Edward Snowden addressed South by Southwest. And he said, when we think about what's happening at the NSA for the past decade, the result has been an adversarial internet, a global free fire zone for governments that is nothing that we ever asked for. It's not what we want, and it's something that we need to protect against. Fuck yeah. So I consider this a call to arms. I would like to do something about it, but what am I going to do? I'm not a wizard. I don't know shit about cryptology, cryptography. I was a medieval history major. I can barely balance a checkbook, and the calculator on my phone gets a workout every time I have to calculate a tip. And I'm not alone. Glenn Greenwald, the journalist that Snowden worked with, Greenwald blew off Snowden two or three times before they made contact because Snowden wanted him to install encryption programs, and he was like, this shit's hard. <laughs> it is hard. So OK, I'm the sorcerer's apprentice. What can I do that's not going to result in a parade of brooms and a flood? So I started to do some research. And that's when I really started to find out how deep the rabbit hole goes. I started looking into the entire topic of government surveillance. You can all laugh at me now. And the first thing I got interested in was the idea of metadata, what they're collecting on metadata. And so with metadata, the initial question I had was, what the fuck is this all about? Metadata is when they capture information about a communication rather than the content of the communication itself. So if they gather about a phone call, who I called, what time it was, how long I talked to them, that's the metadata, they can gather that information and learn a lot without ever having to know the content of that conversation. And there's a great example of this online. And by the way, I have uh, links to all of these resources in these slides, and I'll put these slides online. So there's a great example of this online, a guy named Karen Healy at Duke, who did an analysis of seven organizations in Boston during the Revolutionary War. And all he had was a list of organizations and a list of their membership. And by cross-referencing this, he was able to identify that Paul Revere was near the center of that adjacency graph, that adjacency matrix, without knowing anything about those people. So there's been some amazing talks about this. And the issue with metadata is some really bad decisions are being ba made based on the metadata that's gathered. So you know, it's OK, right? Because they're not collecting this about Americans. It's only foreigners. Yeah? Yeah? Wah, 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 wah. So when you talk to the government about what they're collecting, the result invariably is a refusal to give any more information than is absolutely necessary. To the point where in 2012, Ron Wyden asked the uh, director of the National Intelligence in front of Congress whether the bulk of collection was done against Ameri whether bulk collection was done against Americans. And he said, and I quote, not wittingly. So this is like Humpty Dumpty. When I use a word, it means what I say it means, nothing more and nothing less. If you or I got up and lied to Congress, we would be in jail. This man still has his job, or still had his job. So the problem is there is a certain mentality in the intelligence organizations that says it's all possibly relevant. Gather it all. We'll figure out whether it's useful later. And so they're making an argument that when they capture and store data, they're not actually using it until they analyze it. So when they say they aren't collecting data, what they mean by that is nobody has gone and looked at it yet. But this is why we have a giant, shiny new data center in Utah sucking down power and water like it's going out of style. And once they have all that information, what are they going to do with it? There was in, I think, 2013, there was the revelation that federal agents were using this data to look up information about their love interests, love int. They had a database of email addresses that they were using to surveil people who were active 
who had broken no laws, but were simply expressing their right to a political opinion, and 200 of those people in that database were Americans. So, you know, first of all, I don't think it's okay to do this to anyone, but the way our Constitution and the way a lot of our laws are written, other countries' citizens are fair game. And second of all, what we're learning is that there is a giant iceberg of shadow law that we're not allowed to know about that says, oh, you know, by the way, if they're doing it to them, they're doing it to us too. So basically, this is me at this point. If you're not pissed off, you're not paying attention. So one of the arguments that I get a lot is, why do you give a shit? You know, what are you doing that the government would be, in other than giving this talk, I guess, what do you do that would make the government interested in you? Why do you care? If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. And that's bullshit. And the reasons that it's bullshit would be an entire other presentation, but the single best explanation I've found of it is a paper online, I've Got Nothing to Hide and Other Misunderstandings of Privacy. It's a little dense, but it's a great articulation of why there's a slippery slope here, why it matters that we have the right to associate freely without being tracked, why it matters that we have the right to communicate with each other without being eavesdropped on. So, what am I going to do about this? I decided to see what I could realistically do to start to remove myself from bulk collection. And I want to very narrowly scope the rest of this conversation by saying, Metadata was fascinating to me, and I was going to give a whole talk on how you can protect yourself against bulk collection of your metadata, and the answer was, there really isn't much you can do today. There are people working on this problem, but metadata is a hard problem to solve. The easier problem to solve is how you can protect yourself from bulk collection of your content, of the content of your communications. And so that's what most of these applications do. And I want to make very, very clear that I am not talking about protecting yourself from targeted surveillance because, quite frankly, if they're targeting you, then you're fucked. <laughs> Having said all of that, there are three things that I would choose to, if I could choose to get people to do three things. There are three things that have zero overhead. They're easy to do. They don't make your life complicated. Anybody can turn them on. I would go to every library in the country, turn these on on every PC. I would turn it on on every phone, on all of my relatives' computers. If you do nothing else today, leave this room and do one of these three things, or ideally do them all. So the first one is HTTPS everywhere. SSL used to be expensive. You used to have to expend computational power on encrypting and decrypting websites. When I started working on websites 15 years ago, do we turn on an SSL server? Because you know we're gonna have to get a beefier CPU. Seriously, it's the 21st century. Use HTTPS. There's a tool for this from the EFF. It runs in every major browser. Just do it. The second thing is, stop giving Google this information. Because if you're not adding your data to their vast stores of collected information, then the government can't be getting it from them using national security letters that you're not even allowed to know about. If we're not putting it into these databases in the first place, then it isn't su subject to being hoovered up. DuckDuckGo is just one of the options out there. There are people who argue that you have no idea whether the government is serving these kind of requests on DuckDuckGo, but they state that they're not storing the information, and at least that's better. I'm not trying to find a perfect solution. I'm just trying to get better. And the third thing is private browsing. There's every major browser has the option of incognito mode or private browsing mode. And again, this isn't going to protect you from someone who is watching you make these requests on the wire, but it's going to keep these cookies from being stored long term that are used to track you. It's going to keep some of this information from getting tied together in these databases. It's an incremental approach. So if you do nothing else, incognito mode, my Android phone has incognito mode now. My previous one didn't. It's a step forward. So these are the three things. They cost nothing. They're not hard. Just do it. If you're willing to actually expend a little energy, then the options start to expand. So one of the first things you can do is you can educate yourself. Know who is on our side and who isn't. If you have a choice among services, choose services that are the resistant to this kind of bullshit. There's a great 
report from the EFF on who has your back. There's another thing you can do, which is install Privacy Badger. So if you guys, absolutely, man. If you guys ever ran Ghostry, any of these things that chew on cookies, munge cookies, Privacy Badger is the stable, functional, not a total pain in the ass way to do this. It's not, you know, occasionally I bump into something where the cookie munging interferes with use of a website, and it's reasonably easy to turn it off for that website and then send them a nasty email telling them how much they suck. I really don't understand why so many sites tie their function of their website to Google Analytics. If I can't use your website without blocking Google Analytics cookies, you fail at internet. Another easy approach is alternative DNS providers. Again, we don't have to be giving Google all this data on our lookups. You know, who, who here has 8.8.8.8 as the DNS server on every machine in their lab? You know, decent number of people. It's easy, right? It's free, but you don't have to do that. There are a lot of different options. You know, use something a little saner. There's a set of DNS servers that are available, and there's a list of what they are and what they track and what information they store. You can also look at things like email. With email, I realize that getting people to stop using Gmail is a lost cause. I ain't even going to go there. But for those who are willing to think about other options, one of the first options people think of is what other service should I use? And Google actually provides a great report on who encrypts email in transit between the mail providers. Google does, you know, so they get a gold star for that. There are other email providers who do this kind of encryption. There are email providers that don't. It's probably a good idea to be aware of this because, again, this is an indication of their clue and their willingness to push back. If you're really serious about it, and if you're willing to pay for the privilege, there are relatively inexpensive services that give you the same type of email functionality. You pay a little bit, and you're pulling your data out of the clutches of these databases. Instant messaging. Who here uses instant messaging regularly? How do you get any work done? I am so interrupt driven. I, you know, I, so I'm not an IM user. But there are some great messaging applications that allow you to do secure encrypted IM and chat. Both CryptoCat and Perio are really good options for this. And another thing you can do is start to look at using a VPN service. So I realize that the perception is that VPN services, anonymous VPN services exist so that you can rip off pirated media over BitTorrent. And, you know, that's probably a perfectly legitimate use for it as far as I'm concerned, but there are a lot of other reasons that using an anonymous VPN service is valuable. There's a great list here. Torrent Freak goes through and gives you ratings and pricing, and this is how we chose the one that we use. So all of this, most of this so far, is on things that sit on desks. I spend more of my life on this phone than on any other computing device. How many of you have a phone that you use for personal email? How many of you, keep your hands up, if you also use it for work email? Keep your hands up if you've ever paid a bill on that phone. <laughs> we got a good half the room here. You know, I mean, it is Silicon Valley, so I'm not surprised. but. I also watch cat videos on my, oh, by the way, rooted Android phone. I am the world's worst OPSEC about this. But I'm not going to stop using my phone, and I'm probably not going to stop using it stupidly. You know? So <laughs> realistically, this is what I do. But I can now. I can at least now use incognito mode in Chrome on the phone. There are secure browsers for Android. I've got the Dolphin browser on there. I don't use it as much because, again, you lose functionality. But these are the trade-offs that you, you know, you can figure out what is your level of tolerance for a little more inconvenience to get a little more privacy. There are other applications like Wicker. One of my friends, Noise, turned me on to this. This is a great application if you want to do text messages. I am, I'm still sort of halfway in between Wicker and Text Secure. I'm a little frustrated with Text Secure right now because they're dropping support for encrypted SMS. And I understand that because they want compatibility with Apple, which doesn't do encrypted SMS, but it would be really nice. You know, somebody, there is somebody doing a fork of text secure to continue support for encrypted SMS. These things are complicated. 
In many cases, you don't have to give a shit. If you live here, you have almost zero reason for encrypted SMS because, my God, the Wi-Fi coverage in San Francisco. So again, you look at the tools, you look at the advantages and disadvantages, you decide what works for you. If you're on an iPhone, Signal gives you the same encrypted messaging functionality. And if you really want to get serious about it, you can run Redphone and you can actually do private calls as well as private messages. So these are all getting a little farther down the annoyance scale. There are choices you have to make, there are trade-offs you have to decide what's worth to you. Then you really get into the pain in the ass territory. <laughs> if you're serious about this, and, and again, I want to I want to be very very clear. I am not a person whose life depends on keeping my data private. I'm not a journalist, I'm not an activist, I am not saying or doing anything particularly interesting. And so all of the advice I'm giving here is for people like me. If you're a journalist or an activist, there are a lot smarter people to listen to like Quinn Norton, you know, who understand the issues involved. Eleanor Seta is another one. But for for people like you and me, how far is it realistic to go down this rabbit hole? So would you be willing to run a totally different web browser to have more protection? I discovered I wasn't. It was a pain in the ass. I installed it. I had a problem with it. I never really figured it out. I'm still using Firefox and Chrome. But secure browsers do exist. Now the one cross that I have chosen to die on here is my own personal fucking email. I run my own email, my partner and I run our email, on a Linux server in our basement. This is a commitment. I don't have kids, so I can't say it's like having children, but it's certainly like having another fucking boyfriend. <laughs> Power goes out. Where's my email? OK, backup MX. Power goes back out on the entire East Coast. All my backup MXs are out. We lost about a day and a half of email on that one. DNS goes out. Now we have redundant. I mean, there are so many reasons this is a pain in the ass. Every so often, the combination, the god awful combination of Procmail and the IMAP server that I use barfs up a lung and I can't get email on my phone for a day or two until I figure out what it's choking on. But I control that box and it lives in my basement. And if the government wants access to that physical piece of hardware, they have to knock on my door to get it. Again, I don't expect this ever to matter, so why the fuck am I doing this? Because I think it's worth the hassle, because I think it's worth the principle, and because we've been doing it for 15 years, and at this point I'm not willing to give it up. However, if you are not that much of a masochist, and that's completely legit, there are some really good alternatives. Mail in a box, I don't run this, but I've looked into it for friends who are interested, but masochistic. Mail in a box, basically gives you the ability to get an Ubuntu virtual instance and do what we're doing in our basement with much less hassle. Somebody else is providing redundant power, you know, and making sure your network connectivity is up. The one area that I am most entangled with the people who are gathering my information is Google Calendar. We have four household calendars. We've got my personal calendar, we've got my work calendar, We've got our house personal calendar, and then we've got stuff that I stick into another calendar for stupid reasons. All of this is pulled into my phone, and my entire life is in those calendars. I'm 80% travel. I am in a different city every week, sometimes more than one. And my partner would like to know where I am at night. And you know, oh, by the way, did I forget to tell you that I'm going to Toronto and Montreal in two weeks? So through some giant contortions, we managed to get trip it publishing to something that publishes to Google Calendar so I don't actually have to remember to forward him all of these things because also I have a memory like a piece of cheddar cheese or Swiss cheese. If it was cheddar cheese I'd be better off. Swiss cheese. So anyway, calendars. There is an application, as actually more than one, that lets you replace the functionality of Google Calendar. There is Flock from Whisper Systems who bring us Tech Secure and Signal. And there's another one that I'm really looking at called Zimbra which has an open source option for this. I'm not sure I'm willing to babysit another service like this on my own. We are so entangled with Google Calendar, but if I decide that I have the free time and the mental energy to take on another project, this is going to be the next one. Tor. Tor allows you to browse anonymously, and you have the ability to run it as, you know, run it through a browser instance, run a whole Tor desktop. There are Tor clients for phones. 
So you've got a lot of different options for Tor. I haven't actually found much reason to use it. I know that I probably should be, but you know, generally I'm using the anonymous VPN. And so if there's somebody out there who actually really thinks that Tor is way better than anonymous VPNs and can articulate it in a way that I can understand, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. And then if you're really paranoid, you can get a black phone. And black phone is from, yeah, it's cool tech. I looked at getting one for about five minutes. And I realized, as much as I would love to be that girl, the first thing I would want to do is put Google Play on it and seriously fuck that. I mean, and, and in, in, it would be a complete abuse of what that phone symbolizes. So if you are hardcore enough and you really want to run something that you control and that you have complete control over what goes in and out of it, the black phone is an amazing piece of technology. If you're not quite that hardcore, and I've been playing with this at home with my tablet, it is possible, although incredibly painful, to make a hardened Android device. CyanogenMod is a good start. There's alternatives to Google Play for getting applications onto it. You can sideload a lot of things. If you're interested in doing that, this is a great start. So there's a variety of tools there. I'm using maybe 25% of what I just showed you. A lot of it's interesting to me, but I haven't had the time to dig into it. One of the things that I'm really interested in is what's going to come down the road. And I think there are two areas that are really going to matter here. Usability and ubiquity. So there are two projects that I'm watching. One is dark mail. So who here is familiar with LavaBit? OK, pretty much everybody in the room doesn't need a lot of background. But basically, LavaBit was an email provider who was ordered by the government to turn over their SSL uh, certificates and encryption keys so that they, the government could snoop on all the encrypted email going in and out of their mail servers. And Ladar Levison, who ran that company, shut it down rather than comply. And so, you know, he's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, and I would too. So he has teamed up with the guys at Silent Circle, John Callis, and a bunch of those folks, and they are working on a replacement for email that gives better control, more encryption, and they're starting to chew on the problem of metadata. So they're really starting to, to say, is it possible to communicate with each other and not leak any information or leak only minimal information? So um, the, the dark mail, the dime guys, they just released the first client, first code, I think in December, they released the Magma code. And then earlier this year, in January, they also released their specification. So there's some links in here. Um, Ladar was talking about it on 31C3, at 31C3 over the holidays. And then another interesting one, and this one seems to be a little dormant, but there's an app called Ricochet where they're looking at doing instant messaging without leaking any metadata. And I look at that and I go, how do you even? So I'm really interested to see whether that actually turns into something. So again, tip of the iceberg. These are the tools that I know of, and I'm not an expert at this. There's so much more out there. There's a lot of good resources. If you're sort of an amateur and you just want to know what are the most common and the most well-known and the most well-trusted, one of the best places to go is to look at the privacy pack that was put together for the Reset the Net Day. This is the overview of things that will not make you pound your head against a wall to use them. If you want to dig a little further, there's a site called Prism Break, and Prism Break has an incredible set of resources for all sorts of different operating systems. This is where you start to get into the, you know, am I crazy enough to really need to do this questions? And there's also some great resources out there, books that I either have read or have on the to read stack. The three that I'm finding the most interesting, Dragnet Nation was fantastic by Julia Angwin. I'm about halfway through Data and Goliath, and, I'm, and the next thing in this pile is Intellectual Privacy by, privacy by Neil Richards. So these are some great resources from a philosophical standpoint, from an understanding what's going on and why it's a problem and why we should care and what we need to do about it in the long term. So one of the big challenges is that none of this is a silver bullet. So I run my own mail server. 95% of the people I email are Gmail. Google has the other half of you know that entire conversation from the other side. And you've got people out there, and I know the guy who did this, 
and Philip has incredible credentials. But I'm sorry, if you name your email project Prism Proof, I am automatically going to side eye you and walk away. We are not NSA proof. If it says NSA proof on the can, it's snake oil. And the thing, and I want to be clear here, I think he's got a great idea. I just think he needs to choose a better name. One of the other challenges is who can you trust? There has been for a long time an assumption that government malware, the, the, there have been arrangements with antivirus vendors not to detect government malware on PCs. To the point where Bits of Freedom went out and they actually sent a letter to a number of different malware, uh, antivirus providers and asked if you detected, you know, have you been asked by the government to not detect any malware with your software? And only 30% of those vendors replied. So if you're looking for antivirus, ESET, F-Secure, Kaspersky, Panda, Trend Micro, these are the companies you should be looking at. And you'll notice that there are some big names that are not on that list. The other problem is we don't know what backroom agreements are being struck. And we can't know because when they're done, they're done under secrecy and gag orders. So again, this stuff is baked into the foundations of the net. All we can really do is user space steps to try to protect ourselves. It's still worth doing. So in response to those three laws, I've come up with three of my own. You can't prevent surveillance, but you can make it harder. And it is possible to limit what they get. How far you do that limitation is solely dependent on how much of your own energy, time, and money you're willing to spend. So again, going back to Snowden, the bottom line, again and again, encryption does work. We need to think of encryption not as this sort of arcane black art. It's a basic protection, a defense against the dark arts for the digital realm. So we've talked a lot about the technological challenges and some of the possible solutions, but now there's layer eight. <laughs> there are a number of incredible organizations working on these problems. The ACLU, the Center for Democracy and Technology, EPIC, EFF, the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. I support them with my money. I support them with my time in sending letters and filling out web petitions, etc. I encourage you to get involved with these organizations if you care about these topics. And if you care about these topics, you probably already are. So the big challenge with the government They're fine as long as we're the ones being surveilled. But when you point that at themselves, they start to have a little bit of a fit. And this is where you start to see the pissing matches between different arms of the government where, you know, this group is gathering information about that group and not telling them. So the politicians are now aware of the problem. This is not a good sign for us. So initially, it looked like it might be. One of the first responses to the revelations of the dragnet surveillance was the USA Freedom Act. And when the USA Freedom Act was announced, it was actually a great start. Ending bulk collection under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, strengthening the provisioning prohibition on reverse targeting of Americans, more aggressively filtering out American information. So again, if you're not American, you're still fucked, but at least it's a start, right? That lasted about five minutes. And then the politicians started watering it down and manipulating it and bending it around. And it just turned into a total mess. So in 2014, we saw a new USA Freedom Act introduced. And again, it claimed to make these significant reforms. But the problem is they're giving with the other hand as they're taking away with the first hand. So now they say it bans bulk collection by requiring the government to narrowly limit the scope of its collection. To replace bulk collection, we authorize Section 215 to obtain two hops of daily call records. I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like a ban to me. I don't want less surveillance. I want none of this shit. Or at least I want it to be strictly constrained so that they are only gathering information when they have a reason. And the EFF has been front and center on this 
one of the issues that's coming up is the expiration of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Patriot Act needs to be reauthorized, and I encourage you to go and express to your Congress critters what a bad idea that would be. But the other thing here is there's a 2015 reincarnation of the USA Freedom Act, and we've come so far from the original spirit of that bill that the the Section 215 is now how they're reauthorized is being reauthorized in the USA Freedom Act of 2015. So we went from banning bulk collection to reauthorizing it in three iterations of this bill. The other problem is after the Sony hacks in particular, but as cybersecurity has become a priority and more importantly people have figured out that there's money involved, we have this incredible plethora of information sharing bills. You have the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, which was originally introduced in something like 2011 and just keeps rising from the grave over and over again every time we kill it. There is the Cyber Intelligence Sharing Act, Cyber Security Information Sharing Act, which was introduced uh, in like March of this year in the Senate. And then now there's a National Cyber Security Protection Advancement Act and those are just the three that are getting the most press. There's also a Cyber Threat Sharing Act and a Protecting Computer Network Act. Politicians are full of bad ideas. And we need to be on top of this. We need to keep saying, this is not okay and here's why. One of the arguments that I hear that is friendly fire in my opinion is that if you use the word cybersecurity you are automatically not one of the cool kids. And I'm sorry, but fuck that attitude. We no longer have the luxury of being elitist about our language. These people have the money and the power to make the decisions that control what happens to our information. It behooves us to figure out how to talk to them in language they understand. You don't tell a congressman that it's not a good idea to put a backdoor into smartphone encryption for privacy reasons because frankly they don't give a fuck about your privacy. You tell a congressman it's not a good idea to put a backdoor into smartphone encryption because foreign actors could exploit that backdoor. The, it's, both of these things are true. The end result is the same. We need to get off our high horse and start figuring out what the people who make the rules are motivated by. And there's a great talk by Chris Segoyan that he gave, I'm going to say at Hope, on this topic. You'd like to think the end result is very different. Different how? He says that one works and the other does not. Yes. So that's the politics side. We also have the internet governance side, because at the end of the day, the politicians make the laws, but we write the protocols. I'm active in the trusted computing group. I'm active in IETF. Decisions are being made in these standards bodies that affect the ability to do this on the wire. Get involved. There's a great best current practice that came out early last year pervasive monitoring is an attack. We need to be building encryption and security and privacy functionality into the fundamentals of the internet. Because if we do that, then we can have a two-front war where we're battling it on our own, but we're also battling it as a, as a community. So one last note and quote, they are setting fire to the future of the internet. The people who are in this room now, you guys who came to see this talk, you are the firefighters. We need you to help fix this. Do something. Help your friends do something. Tell people about something. Pull these slides down. Give this talk at your local information security conference. Give it at your local hackerspace. I promise you, I don't know anything more about this than you do. I just spent a year and a half digging into the high-level stuff because I care. 
take these, take this information, take these tools, and spread them and share them. That's it. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to turn this around a little bit. What tools should I have in this set that I don't know about? Tails? OK. What? It's in there. Thank you. No problem. What? OTR? Somebody's going to have to explain it to me well enough that I can include it and not sound like an idiot. Chat secure. OTR, Tails, build a botnet? Invisible, yes, definitely. I don't know what that is. Say it again. What's the name of it? Threema? Secure texting server in Switzerland, OK. Anybody else? Unplugged in the back? Disconnect, OK, thank you. Full disk encryption, absolutely. That's not going to help you much against bulk collection, but if you make a stupid tweet about hacking an airplane and they take away your electronics, you're going to be really happy you encrypted your disk. I am not knocking him, but that was a dumbass thing to tweet from an airplane. Yes. Well, after the fact, it's kind of obvious. I'm, it's the kind of thing that I would have done. I'm glad somebody else did it first so I could go, oh, shit, that's a bad idea. So questions from you guys? What's my web page? Ah, so I haven't actually figured out. So there are, there are versions of this that are online from previous, I've given this talk three or four times now. If you search for Lorenzen, L-O-R-E-N-Z-I-N, and practical counter surveillance, you will find it in multiple forms. I will get these slides online somewhere. I haven't really figured out where yet. I cannot put them on my cable modem because, oh my god, our bandwidth is crap enough as it is. That is the downside of hosting your web server off your cable modem in your basement. But I would say give me a week and then do a search and I will make them be somewhere easy to find and I'll, I will see if the B-Sides folks can link to them. So the other thing is I'm on Twitter, at L. Lorenzen, and so I will, I will put them some, I will put something that makes them findable. I should probably actually put a link in my Twitter bio or something, because that's the thing that most people are looking for when they look at me on Twitter. Other questions? Absolutely. So he's saying that Section 215 of the Patriot Act is coming up for renewal. The next two months are the most critical time for that discussion. There's great information about this on the ACLU webpage, on the EFF webpage. You. Ah, so the, the comment is privacy badger prevents cookies, but you don't have anything that prevents fingerprinting or super cookies. That's because I don't know of anything. What should I know about? What's the name of the tool? Tor, OK. Thank you. That's good to know. What's the organization? I'm going to have you say the name so it's on the record. OK. So Lee Brotherston up in Canada, he did some really nice work on men in the middle that ISPs are doing. So just getting the message out there. Fabulous. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, that's a critical key point. So he's saying that as, yep. In the same way that we need to be talking to the politicians, we also need to be talking to the people who don't give a shit and aren't like us and just use the internet and are putting their information out everywhere willy-nilly. John Oliver interviewing Snowden and talking about the government snooping on, their dick, on people's dick pics probably did more to raise awareness around this issue than any other single thing ever. And this is why, you know, your local library is a great way, you know, do a lightning talk. Do a little seminar at your local library. 
hacker spaces are probably, they're another good one, but again, it's people who look like us, and we need to get this out to the general public who don't know what's going on and don't have a reason to care yet. Anybody else? Great, thank you guys for your time.